Good, how are you doing?
Yes, indeed. Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started? Call us to order. Do we have any uh, folks signed up from the public to speak? Oh, quite unlike last month. Okay. Okay, great. Everybody have a chance to look at the minutes? Do I have a motion to approve? A second? All in favor? Okay. Minutes approved. Okay. I'm going to try to stay on the agenda, so keep me straight on that, would you? Okay, thank you. It'll be a first. Discussion action on update of Parks, Recreation, Open Space, Zoo Projects, Open Space Land Acquisition. Do we have a presentation? with economic development. Good afternoon. Um, good news. We have been postponed a couple times in this presentation, so it's a little dated. Um, this is based off a presentation I gave council back in February. So brief history. So, oh, sorry. Back in the early 2000s, open space advocates started to push for large open space acquisitions by the city. This led to a November 6, 2012 bond that included $5 million specifically dedicated for the acquisition of open space. Those funds would happen over time. Um, so from when the bond passed until 2023, we will have the $5 million. So this, earlier this year, uh, council approved on February 6th to move forward and acquire 366 acres in the northeast part of, uh, of El Paso, the land known as uh, the Knapp Land, which will soon be renamed Knapp Canyon. Here's just some examples of where in the El Paso code, um, the zoning code, it shows what open space is. The, the land, as I spoke, is the Knapp properties, which if you look at, um, there's a little blue section there. It's roughly 156 acres. That is how we were able to actually accumulate the funds to acquire the land because the land cost was $3.5 million, 1.5 of which came from our bond fund. The rest came from 10% funds from PSB. So we joined together and we were able to acquire 366 acres, which is the largest acquisition of open space that the city of El Paso has ever done for the purpose of open space. I have to qualify that because the state did acquire much more land for what is now Franklin Mountains State Park. As you can see, there are different colors here. What that, those different colors show is the orange section is the larger section. That is what we bought for 3.5 million. The teal color, slight greenish color, that is land that they donated. And if you look at the blue and yellow area, there's an area that's hashed in red. That's an area that's gonna be dedicated through plat to the city by the property owners whenever those two subdivisions uh, get created. Uh, again, the appraised value of the property was 3.8 and we were able to get a slight discount of 3.5. 
And with that, I will say that we did close uh, May 25th on it, so it is now within our inventory. And uh, we are looking to potentially put a, either a trailhead or trails on the site, but we still have to come, we're still waiting on the water utility to tell us exactly what kind of infrastructure they're gonna put in to make sure that it's mitigating the storm water because that area is prone to flood. And with that, I'll take questions. Yeah, who, who appraised it? Uh, Martha Gilby at RB Quest. Are you familiar with them? Too many. The 1.5. That is correct. So in the open space bond money, we have roughly three mil a little bit over $3 million remaining. Currently in our coffers, we have a little bit, I'd say around 100000 I can give you a specific number uh, if you give me a chance to get back to my office to make sure that number. But uh, it's roughly about 100,000 that we currently have, and next year we'll get 187, followed by 187 the year after that, and so on until the last two years where we get uh, a substantial bump. One year we get 1.5, the other year we get 1 million. The Nap Land also extended down south farther as well. There's a whole other section, if I understand correctly. They do own other property there. Uh, but this, so when... This was the primary base yeah, when, on, the, on the subdividing that was already taking place on the lower end. So, so there was actually, it's not that we haven't done anything over from 2012 till now. It took three years to, to work with OSAB and Parks Department, later uh, CID Department, later uh, economic development, we all worked together to create a list that had specific uh, guidelines on what we were looking at when it came to open space. And it assigned a value on, I think it's over 67 properties that are on this list. And based on those values, this was the fifth most uh, highly rated property, but it was the largest property on that list. And because of that, uh, OSAP really pushed that we move forward and acquire this. While the NAPs do have other properties on the northeast side of the, of the mountain, this specific one was prop priority property number five, is what it was called for a long time. And that's why we went after it, because not only was it in the top five, but compared to the other properties in the top five, none of them were close to it in size. And none of them were as, how can I say this? as close to being developed as this one was, which is what open space um, property acquisition was all about, making sure we preserved open space and stopped it from being developed. Because there were already sections of this property that had been platted or were in the process of being platted. Now, whether or not that would have come to fruition. The question there comes down to, it had also been taking place for almost four years with going through True. the process, which means nothing had actually gone forward because True. you kept delaying the payment of the cost to do such, uh, I believe it was a economic impact survey or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. It was the delaying process and nobody would pay for it, meaning that family was doing this. But listen, I, I, I like the fact that they bought it. I just wonder, did, did the city get finagled based on what you just mentioned? Well. I don't know if the city got finagled or not because we we acted on behalf of what OSAP, which was their function, right? To be able to identify properties that they wish to acquire for open space. It went through a specific process. Each value, each property was valued, and this was in the top five of the value, and not only that was the largest. Furthermore, the specific property already had little sections, which I believe is the perfect spot to create the trailhead that had already been graded. And so you don't start grading land unless, because it takes money. You're already investing money into potentially developing it. So whether or not 366 acres, that is what this property entails, was gonna be developed tomorrow, three years from now, 20 years from now, I can't tell you. But I'm pretty sure that the property owners had 
uh, had plans for it because when I discussed with them, they, they did have plans. And they did show me some pretty advanced renderings of what they had planned. And, and just for the record, we actually had that discussion in this room to the extent we actually saw the renderings that they had brought up. Those renderings I saw years ago mm -hmm. at the same concept. So my point is, is that I, I, and we've said this many a time, there's a lot of stuff that gets discussed in this room that apparently stops this room and doesn't get moved on to those other entities. And I just want to make sure that we did have that discussion, that there might be leveraging what they considered and threatening, I use the word lightly, but bringing up the fact that they may be doing this to kind of push. And, and, and all I'm saying is, listen, uh, the, the people that are traditionally on here get to get some input. They get to, they, they, they hear the outside public opinion based on just all of our professions. So I would just say that maybe, actually, I mean, I've said it for years, but using our recommendation for something more of a, a value just to be 3.5 for, it seems high. 3.5 for the largest land acquisition for the purpose of open space in the history of the city of El Paso. You may say it's high. It serves 156 acres of that land, serves a specific stormwater mitigation reason. I think if you look at it as a whole, you're saying roughly 156 is going to help stop flooding south of that. So if you look at Hondo Pass and look at all the houses down south, I'm sure they're very happy that there is going to be stormwater mitigation above them. If you look at the rest of the land and what it abuts, it abuts a state park, right? And if you if we look at all these if things we're going to as bring in the whole, state park as a whole, the state park was also debating inquire, acquiring the land in themselves. Mm -hmm. There had actually been the state had also brought up the fact of using the money, and the only reason I say that is because in this meeting. They actually discussed the fact of using 1.5 of our total five. Now, originally, and I'm, I'm glad that the PSB came through because originally they were talking about using all of it mm -hmm. to buy not just this piece, but also the other piece originally. And what we had discussed is the fact that we cut out, you, you mentioned your uh, priority list that is pretty long because they brought mm -hmm. up the priority list at that time. Exactly. So, and a lot of it included a lot of stuff down in the lower valley, you know, stuff that uh, the little pieces. Right? I, actually, the majority, in fact, there is not one property on the priority list that is not on the map. Okay. So, and so they're, they're, they brought the out a little color, they brought out a little uh, color coded list of all the things that came up. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that, listen, it, it just seems like sometimes we, we jump before we know it's there. And, and the cost, I, I appreciate that it, that it came in appraised higher. I'm just saying that it seemed as though the Knapp family kind of leveraged us as the city using this money to do something. And I just want that for the record because we put it on the record whenever we were talking about the fact that we thought they were doing it because it kind of presented itself whenever they brought it up a year ago. I'm sure they leveraged every open space advocate that they could, wanting to potentially make some money. Yes, I think that's what any property owner will do, trying to get their the most they can out of a fund, right? Um, but we spoke with the state. They weren't moving anytime soon on acquiring the land because we also looked at them as potential partners. Obviously, if we could have said, I'll spend a million instead of 1.5 million, we got two from water and maybe the rest from the state, we would have done that. They weren't interested in doing that. And if they were really interested in acquiring the land, they would have moved forward and done it. So we did look at, at that option, as we did with potential grants and anything that may have been available at, at the time. And I think we actually did a, a pretty good job of protecting the limited funds we do have for open space. When was the last time you updated the land, that map with the priority properties on it? Well, we're in the process of doing that just now. So, like I said, we went after what OSAP 
had wished not only the current board but the board before that mm -hmm. uh, we're actually last OSAD meeting last week on Wednesday we discussed how to move forward and whether or not we want to revisit the list and incorporate land from other parts of town um, so I think that's I think they're actually going to do a special session of OSAD that's going to deal specifically with that um, behind you know, behind closed doors so we can have an open discussion of what we're looking for. Will you bring that to us when it's completed? Of course. Okay. Thank you. Uh, will the remaining funds left, uh, uh, be, will, will we be able to acquire the, the one through four uh, top priority for the, uh, for the remaining funds? Yeah, actually, I believe we can, but it all depends on what OSAB decides. Like I said, we're going to revisit the, that list and see if we can incorporate other properties um, from different parts of town. Because right now, like I said, the list is very heavy on things on the map. And I don't know if that's suiting the whole city, because it's not just OSAB for the Northeast. It's not just you know open space for people that live along the mountain. The mountain's very important. Um, but there are other opportunities for open space. Uh just uh, as a clarification, so I'll this for legal purposes, the uh, by the Open Space Advisory Committee is also an advisory in nature, and so ultimately any changes to any priority list would go to council as well for approval. Yes. Previously, we had both presented from OSAP to BOAC and then got in their blessing before we went to council. So, so that way everybody knew that everybody was planning and thinking yeah, and I think at that and time we did a joint forward. meeting and so that, that that's also something that could possibly if you all wanted to do and I think it was very useful to have both Black's opinion and OSAP's opinion sure. to be ready to go to council with the with the whole uh, lost dog thing going on right now so just so I'm made aware if it is purchased as open space, it can be still converted at the leisure of the council. If I may, I don't know that that's that, purposes of the what's posted right now. Just just to a recommendation. Talking about open space, aren't we? Wouldn't we want to know? Right, that but that it's, that it's I, I'm not I sure that ask, that's in the list. I can answer either. in general terms of acquiring open space. I'm just asking for yeah. what the what. The so my recommendation state. is just let's keep it general in nature. Like if we want something more specific in future agendas, then we could possibly put something on there so we can have proper posting on there. So, so let me try to answer that in general terms. When we use bond money to acquire open space, we have to make sure that the intent of what that bond money was put forth for is upheld. So when we acquired things for open space, ultimately, um, that is why we acquired it. We, whenever we have land throughout the city, regardless of when we acquired it, we always look back on what funds were used. How were those funds designated to be used? And we try to make sure that that property is used in that way. Okay, and, and I apologize. I, I took as when it said open space landmark acquisition that that would encompass if that acquisition takes place, could that acquisition for open space land be used for something else? Sure, and, and the reason I bring it up is that we just had OSAP uh, not just very recently, and I know that it was sort of brought up, and then it was my understanding it's not even part of the current list that's on there, um, this particular parcel that you're talking about. So. And I know there's a lot of uh, interest in that idea, and I just want to make sure for our legal purposes that if we, there's a specific one that we want to discuss, that we're very careful, especially because no, 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 it I, is acquisition I don't, purposes. I don't care about lost dog. That's already in place and place. I'm talking about this land okay. can't be traded for something else. Or can it? Because it was bond money, does it have to stay open space is my question. That is the intended purpose of the acquisition, and that that is. I, I'm asking, can it? That because council, it was bond money, can it be can it be transferred to other use? It 
I, I don't know the answer to that. I would go to legal and say the specifics of that, but it's, it was bought for open space purposes. That is the intent of it. The most amount of infrastructure you will see is stormwater mitigation, a trail, and a trailhead. That's it. Okay, can we ask legal to get us a definition on that? Can you repeat what you, what you want to can know? Can money used from the bond to purchase open space, can that open space be then transferred to other use? So the bond money needs to be used with what we told the voters that we're going to be using it for. But after it's been acquired, so can it be transferred? After it's been acquired, then I, I would not answer any hypotheticals and at this moment. I think that there are a lot of facts that we would have to... Not that we'd have to by can ordinance, it, by ordinance, is it preordained to stay open Once space? it becomes city city property, then we would have to look at what what the next purpose would be. I mean, I have no idea what they would... if they, What would they intend to use it for? We're I mean, posing the question. Would you ask? You, yeah. Yes, but I'm telling you in general answers to a hypothetical is going to be really hard to give you an answer to say could they use it for any purpose well any purpose is not really a fact you well, have to say like no. what could you like, ask if it's for longevity um purposes as far i guess as i would have to find out if i, I can also answer maybe something that'll appease but kind of hear where this is going like okay we bought it can we change the purpose well we are actually looking forward to putting a conservation easement on it and that conservation easement runs with the land and so, because of that, the land would forever be open space. The only thing that's holding us up right now is, one, we've owned this property for a little bit less than a month. And two, we have a little bit of infrastructure that's going to go in place, and we don't want to put something that's going to stop that from going. So once that's finalized, then yes, we would move forward and put a conservation easement on it, which would um, make it essentially run with the land and be open space as it's intended per the bond funds. And also as a follow-up, which is what you're saying, I don't know once they closed on the sale what was put in any conditions that were put on the actual closing and the deeds. And um, Tracy just came up and tell me if, if it's going to be dedicated as a park. So all those things are going to be facts that we would need. And then... Like I said, hypothetical, I don't know what they could, you know, that, that all kind of matters, too, in, in terms of an answer. Well, but a hypothetical is only a hypothetical until right. it takes place, and then right. you see it happening currently, then it becomes a little less hypothetical and right. more, listen, we just spent $1.5 million of money that was bond, bond money mm -hmm. to buy something that, as, and not to, not to throw anybody under the bus here, but you have a developer that's saying, well, I'll give you this if you give me that. It just, I just want to make sure, is, is there any security in using that $1.5 million that was used for open space to maintain open space? And, and like I said, I, we're, I acting, you, you, you we're acting to keep it open space. And I can't talk to other land that's elsewhere, specifically to this land. We bought it using open space funds. We're going to keep it open space. Okay. And but if, if and legal can find that, just get a little bit more definition if there's any requirement on its day in open space. Requirement per the use of the money or per the covenants that were purchased in the money. Just just so we have that clarification. With that, thank you. NIP update. IT, can you please bring up the same presentation? <clears throat> Thank you. Yvette Hernandez, um, good afternoon. For NIP, we still have um, NIP round two to uh, report on. Um, we're about to finish the last two that are in construction. So there's a picture of Manhattan Heights. I believe the project manager informed me today that the only thing uh, remaining is the brick cladding along the columns and then HT Ponsford, um, both of which will be completed in July. Um, Manhattan Heights should be early July with HT Ponsford um, in the latter part of that month. Um, so that will leave only one remaining, and that's the one that's in aligned with um, the water utilities. So once Thomas Manor, once water utilities is around 95% complete on construction with their project, then we will um, begin ours. 
for the NIP round three. Um, we've had a couple that have moved in to completed projects. So we're now um, 12 projects that are completed. That's uh, Edgemere, just to name some of the recent ones since the last time we, we met, Edgemere Bench, uh, Mountain View, uh, Pueblo Viejo, and Houston Park. Um, all our projects are now in construction and some of the ones to be completed here shortly is Socorro Road in July, uh, Montoya Heights. Um, th that's a uh, park equipment and that should be installed um, starting within the next two weeks. And then Angora Loop will begin construction in July. Um, I received an update from Mark Weber and their group, the NIP round four. That was um, supplied, that list was supplied to CID on Wednesday. And so we have eight to 10 weeks to begin the construction estimates. So they're moving along in that process. Um, the next will be, it's listed, um, Bernie as the bond updates, and that will be presented by Lily Gutierrez. Can I ask on the NIP, is oh, this still yes, NIP? Sir. Yes, sir. So uh, is the, are they, they have made a real effort to try and gain in some more, uh, to validate more associations or to make them. Oh, uh, Nicole's done quite the outreach, yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, have they, have they had any success with getting more I guess, I think you'll qualified see this next, organizations? It's not much so qualified, but I think you're going to see a diversity in projects. You're not going to have the typical shade canopies, benches for parks. Um, she's really done a lot of outreach, and so some of the requests that have come back have been different than your typical projects. What I mean is that they had to go through a vetting process, become a, a neighborhood organization to be able to qualify for the NIP money. Yes, you had you had to like register with the city, keep a meeting log, and stuff like that. Is that correct? I believe so. Yes. Do you know if that's inc the amount of organizations that qualify? Have I know that the amount of applications is significantly larger than okay. the last uh, three rounds. Are they from the same? I mean, could you find out if they, I could the find next, out for the next update? Could you find out if or if the amount of organizations registered has increased? I can definitely tell you yes, but okay. I can give you a percentage um, the next time we meet. But I know for a fact that all the she had design labs, she had two design labs, um, and she's done outreach with different um, partners. And I know that with all her endeavors, she's had a positive response back. Yeah, because I know at the very beginning, we weren't actually maximizing the use of the money at the very beginning when it came out. So it just, it, as the, the community outreach has increased the amount of organization, like a lot of the neighbor, because we, we don't have as many um, HOAs, a lot of the associations hadn't processed, like a neighborhood association hasn't really organized enough to qualify for the money, but that seems like it has increased. Yes, I'll get you the number specifically, but you can walk away from this meeting knowing that um, their endeavor has worked and it definitely has increased. Are they maxing out the funds use of the Oh, use of yes, okay. definitely. <laughs> yeah, um, that's why we're going through this eight to 10 weeks of looking at the cost estimates because we will not be able to do all the projects. There are some that either um, based upon constructability or feasibility with available funds, we'd have to turn them away. So um, I believe typically it's like two per district is the amount of money that they have. And we've had quite a bit of applicants. Good afternoon, Lily Gutierrez, Capital Improvement Projects Administrator for the Zoo. And so I'm gonna start with the Asian Gateway Project. This project was, um, budgeted for one point, almost $1.3 million. The construction NTP was given September 25th of last year. And um, we had our grand opening uh, June 22nd. So I wanted to show you the rendering from the designer, which is on the top, top left. And, um, and then the bottom right is your completed project. You can see the rockwork structures on either end of the paved walkway, you can see the grand steel pen drawers with the, um, with the hanging baskets. Those are normally um, bamboo poles in the Asian culture, and um, so these were made out of steel. And then, of course, in the background, you can see the carousel, and that's the 36-foot um, endangered species carousel that was donated by the Zoological Society. 
Um, and I did put some pictures in here for you to see. Um, so you see the zebra and then the Mexican gray wolf, the eagle, um, and red, red panda back there. Um, so next up we have is the Chihuahuan Desert. The Chihuahuan Desert is at 14.2 million. The NTP for that one was given March the 6th. And um, of course we're heavy into uh, construction right now. So demolition, um, oh, well here's the rendering of the, the project. And um, so this is a picture of when um, the construction wall came, came up. I wish I had a, a pointer, but that little yellow line um, is the construction wall. So this is right before the demo um, activity started. And then this next um, picture, it's actually a video and I'm not sure, can we play videos on here? And I'm not sure how to do this. What do I, oh, I just messed it up. Darn it, okay. Start seeing the foundation for the ranch house, um, and then in the middle you'll start seeing the um, the grading being done for the vault for the rockwork structure, and um, that's where the all the water the tanks are going to go for the the water feature. And so that was my time lapse video for the construction. <laughs> and then um, finally, your, our upcoming project is the penguin exhibit. Um, right now, I have allocated for that project. 3.7 million. Um, it is in the RFQ process, so uh, we did have four um, RFQ packages that were submitted, and um, the rating process is going on right now, and so we don't know who, who's going to get that design yet, um, but we should know probably by next week. And um, so the the concept for the um, the penguin, hopefully, what, what, we'll, what, what, what we are wanting to receive is um, um, outdoor viewing of the penguins, and then of course underwater viewing. We would like an outdoor seating area for these penguins. Um, we want a natural habitat that will provide um, enrichment, such as a, a wave maker and um, possibly a snow making machine. And, um, and then an interactive spaces for the penguins and the guests. And of course, the life support systems. And that's all I have for you. Do you have any questions on any of those? Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, <clears throat> on to the quarterly activity report. IT, the same presentation. Thank you. Um, so two weeks ago, um, CID provided the quarterly update for our entire program. So we used these slides and condensed it to um, quality of life. Um, so one of the things that, that we wanted to report on this is not just quality of life um, numbers, but just to let you know, to let you know how active um, CID is. So we're estimating about three hundred uh, million dollars in expenditures. Um, some of the major projects to the side, um, we do have the quality of life projects, the three rec centers, um, and also the water parks um, below. So that's our um, anticipated um, projection for the, the two years of how much money and, and projects that are going through. So projects that have started in design um, from February to May, there was a total within CID of 22 projects and uh, we've highlighted three of the quality of life. 13 projects went out to bid um, for quality of life. That was uh, the NIP Angora Loop which um, that's to begin in July. 36 projects um, started within this time frame. As you can see, the, uh, a substantial amount, amount was also quality of life, uh, most of them being the completion of the NIP round three. Um, Judge Marcus um, is estimated to be completed um, 
later this year, and that's mill work and improvements into their uh, check-in, check-out stations. Uh, borderland uh, park improvements, as well as to be completed in the fall of this year, as shade canopy, benches, and um, resurfacing of the basketball court. Um, so 23 projects were completed and open to the public within this time frame of February to May. Um, most notably on, in April was the Westside Natatorium. Um, so projected from starting June to August um, to start design, we have um, five, <laughs> five projects for quality of life slated to start. Um, the water parks um, were gaining momentum. Um, hopefully in July, we will have a lease agreement for District 2. And we are currently working on a lease agreement for uh, District 1. And District 4, which is uh, the Cohen area, that has been identified, um, met with Park Hill earlier today, and we're ready to start the, the survey um, for that project. Uh, paved trails, um, mountain to river. Um, this will this project will be um, constructed under design build, and uh, we're looking to start in the winter of of this year. One of the reasons why we really wanted to do design build is there there are a lot of experts out there. Um, we feel that if we could have them take on the liability of design and construction, we'll provide um, a product to our very vocal and, and users and, and those that are very um, interested in, in, in our trail. So I, I think this is a, a good match uh, for this project. June through August, um, for going out to bid, um, we have four projects out of the 26 that are quality of life. Um, I don't know if you guys are aware, but the Northeast Regional Park is now um, the Joy um, Barasa and Vino Memorial Park, and this is phase two, which includes a championship soccer field, three soccer fields, dog park, plaza area, um, and also the amenities. Really excited about that addition to the Northeast. Um, and here are the three rec centers. Um, they are in the bidding, they will be in the bidding phase. So Alameda, Chamisal, and Loma Land. And then projects to start construction within these next three, three months, um, we have four out of the 23 that will be starting for quality of life. Um, so moving, this is the, the next item on the list um, to segue into the theming for the water parks. Wanted to brief you on, on what we've been doing in our outreach. So for a month, we had located on our city website um, the citizens of El Paso could click onto here and provide um, answers. We had three different questions asking them how would they classify El Paso, their neighborhood, what sets their neighborhood apart. Um, we developed word patterns um, for each of the districts and out of those that, that were uh, most common, it was pretty, pretty interesting to see that um, there was diversity in the responses and that helped us to develop um, the five themes. So overall, what you do see is that within all of the five um, areas, um, mountains, culture, and sunny, that came up true, tried and true for all of the five um, uh, regions. Um, overall wants is a uh, shades, um, <laughs> and basically something to do. So the caliber of these water parks uh, will definitely meet those needs. Um, so sorry, but I'm treating you like the citizens of El Paso. <laughs> As we are meeting with them, um, we have been uncovering the themes. So for um, district, I'm sorry, district seven, um, based upon their responses, it was very much a fiesta theme. Uh, District 4 in the Northeast, there was a lot of sports activity, and um, that's the theme, the, the Arroyo also being close to the mountain. Um, so you'll see a lot of um, sports and activity integrated into that one. 
um, District 1. Um, it's the tropical oasis island. Um, with a lot of the responses that we got from them, it, it married itself to um, have the water park be identified um, with that theme. And then the last one on the far east is your backyard um, oasis. And I guess it really played true to their location and proximity to the Waco Mountains. Um, so if you guys are bored on June 8th and 28th, I invite you to Ross Middle to see the uncovering of the last theme. Um, no, uh, yes, so it's Cohen. So of the 50 acres, um, we're serving five acres on that site. Um, and it plays in really well um, with the master plan that we presented back in January. Um, we have, if you notice on the bottom of the slide, it says my Kotu. They are our branding and entertainment consultant. So they've worked with all the feedback. I think it was like 274 respondents. So they worked with that feedback, the master plan and the feedback that Exico garnered with their um, community meetings. And they've been working at um, getting the master plan together for Cohen. So we've been able, with all that information, to actually identify five acres that work well within those 50 acres. Um, I cannot start, I've started on acquiring the grading and demo consultants. So they're on board, they should be starting July, uh, within July for that. Yes, so um, Cohen was located more towards uh, 54. So we're a little bit more along Cohen Avenue, kind of like centrally located. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we're going to keep the parking lot for dust containment and the people can still use it while they, they have the, the water park. Yes. But the lease, that, that's the survey, the lease we're still working on District 2 and District 1. I Thank you. Um, and um, so this is just a, a recap uh, of the water parks. Um, so we began meeting with the communities um, on June 11th, um, and our last one is the 28th. Um, so I unfortunately was out last week on uh, vacation, <laughs> but I've heard from Sam that we got some really good feedback. Everyone was really excited. I did attend the June 11th, and um, they were really excited to, to see in there. They're anxious. 2020 cannot get here soon enough. For me, I need a little bit more time. But for them, they are really excited. So it was good to, to see that. We're still in negotiations. So um, hopefully by the next council, which I believe is July 10th, um, that will be um, the lease agreement will go to council and it will be, it will be made known. Yeah. Yes. Um, District 2 has been um, already announced to the community that it will be at Ross Middle. We're just finalizing that lease agreement. Um, so as soon as that's finalized, I can cut loose the, the designers to start their survey and, and begin on, on their design. On uh, Ross Middle, do you know the timelines given the construction that's going to be happening on that property there for the school district? Is that going to delay the project at all? No, sir. Um, there is an excellent just dividing line that school district can start, and we do not intend on um, stopping their progression at all. I believe uh, Mr. Dayanar told us that like late in the fall is when they plan to break ground. Break ground on the on on theirs. Mm -hmm. and, and will it require demolition on the city's part of property that's there already? There, within our property, there is a smaller softball field and okay. some portables, um, but it does not impact their, their project. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, if no questions.
questions regarding uh, the quarterly or water parks, I can um, turn it over to MCAT in their okay. list of presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Tracy Jerome, Museums and Cultural Affairs Department. Um, we are very honored to have invited and to have with us today um, the founding executive director for the Children's Museum, Dr. Paul Cortinar. Um, Paul and I have been on the road together, um, and we are making rounds right now speaking to various um, community groups um, about the Children's Museum and the proposed um, project um, and moving that forward. And we thought it would be very helpful for, for Paul to come in and meet you today and share the presentation with you that um, he is presenting um, throughout the community now. Um, we're meeting with uh, all the different various members of council um, and attending council meet, uh, their community meetings. Um, but you can't always get there, so we thought we'd come to you. So I'd like to introduce you, if you haven't met him yet, Dr. Paul Cortinar, and he'll be sharing his presentation today about the Children's Museum Project. Welcome, Paul. The, uh, we'll be gentle with you. Oh, I, I wasn't worried. <laughs> Uh, is the uh, presentation preloaded? Sorry? Uh, presentation 5A from IT. Uh, there we go. So, um, I, my name is Paul Cordner. I'm new to El Paso, and I'm here as the executive director of the soon-to-be-built Children's Museum. Uh, the number one question I get asked all the time is, why a children's museum, and, and uh, what does it contribute to the city? So it is primarily an educational institution. We provide educational opportunities to the children and families of El Paso that are not available elsewhere in the city. They're not available in the formal school system. And they're not available in, in, uh, in other, other less structured environments. And so the educational uh, ethos of a museum like this is designed around three things. First of all is when families come in, when kids come in, it's free choice, right? They can go to any exhibit that they're interested in. They can uh, work in areas that they have an interest or they can discover a new interest. Uh, by walking around. If you'll remember your own formal education, which for me was a very long time ago, you'll remember that it wasn't a uh, free choice, that you didn't have a lot of choice when you walked in the classroom about what you were going to learn each day. And we know that education is much more effective when children take ownership of the education they're going to have. Uh, the second part of the structure of the museum is that we know that education is socially situated. That is, when children uh, argue, discuss, work together to solve a problem, they build knowledge about that problem much more successfully. Uh, again, if you think about the formal school system, we've intentionally designed the school system to prevent uh, kids from working together. In fact, uh, the one way you know you're going to fail your SAT is if you turn to your neighbor and ask for help. And meanwhile, in real life, you know that the one way you're going to fail on anything you take on is if you don't turn to your neighbor and ask for help. And so we have to give kids the opportunity to work in teams, to solve problems together, because that's actually what they're going to be doing in real life. And then the third thing is that every exhibit in this museum is experiential and experimental. Each exhibit poses a problem, a challenge. It might be engineering, it might be science, it might even be language-based. And children have to work a solution to that problem as they go. Now, I noticed that everyone who comes up talks about this, so you know that there was money in the 12, 2012 Quality of Life Bond for this Children's Museum. Um, I want to discuss today a little bit about how that money is going to be used and, uh, and how we're going to look at financing the, the final museum that we're planning for the city. So um, these are renderings of the museum. Uh, some of them are in existing museums. Uh, the one on the far right, that's the climber that we're planning for our particular museum. So when you start to think about designing a children's museum, and in this case is a children's museum sort of slash science center, uh, you have to think about who's going to put together a master plan for that museum. And we approached a company called Gyroscope in California. They're the same group that did the exhibits for the Thinkery in Austin. They're the same group that did the exhibits for the Moxie in Santa Barbara. 
And if you follow museum news, the Moxie was just rated by the New York Times as one of the five best museums in North America, and it just opened a year ago. Both the Moxie and the Thinkery have much, much higher attendance. In the case of the Thinkery, it's more than double the attendance that they expected to get. And it's because of the quality of the exhibits that they have. And so we approach the same company. And what that company does, Gyroscope, is they come to the city. In this case, El Paso, they hosted 30 separate public engagement sessions, both with general members of the public and with specific stakeholders. So for example, I've explained this is an educational institution. They met with all of the ISDs, EPISD, Socorro, et cetera. They also met with EPCC representatives and with UTEP representatives, trying to figure out how can we make this museum work best to support the educational goals of the community that we're in. So how do we make the museum specific to El Paso? And how do we make it really work for the children here? And so uh, the result of that, uh, of those public meetings, of the presentations that we did, was a, a design, a master plan for this museum that, that we have presented to the city. At the same time, we knew that the city wasn't going to be able to take on that kind of work. And so I want to make it clear that all of these things that happened, and that's 16 public meetings, that's pre uh, all of the work we've done since I've been here. So as I say, there's now been over 30. Uh, all of that work was done with the El Paso Community Foundation. So the Community Foundation took a look at the signature projects of the 2012 bond and asked where they could get involved to really spur the development of something special for El Paso. And they got involved with the Children's Museum. So up until now, all of the spending, that is hiring Gyroscope to create a master plan for the museum, all of the engagement with the public that we've undergone, and the architectural contest, which you may have seen online because we gave the public the chance to vote, on which architect's uh, design dream was, was the best for the city. All of those things were taken on by the El Paso Community Foundation, not by the city of El Paso, in order to pre prepare the groundwork to build the right museum for the city. So there were three things taken on that we need, knew we needed to finish before we went to the city and, and figured out a feasible plan to produce this new museum. That was a master plan for the new museum, which has been presented to the city, and you've seen some of the uh, renderings for that. Uh, it's a building design, so we approached, we did a huge international architectural competition. We had an, um, an expert panel, but we also asked members of the public. The expert panel and the members of the public chose the same group, so that's who we're going to move forward with, and we hired a CEO, which is me. And this talks a little bit more about the kinds of exhibits so that you can see that these are not exhibits that are static where somebody steps back and watches something happen. I used to work at the Ontario Science Centre in Toronto and uh, it was one of the two original science centres in the country along with the Exploratorium in San Francisco. And they were an original design in the 60s when they opened in 69. The idea was that you push a button and watch something happen and that was engaging. And of course, we know nowadays that pushing a button and watching something happen is not, A, it's not what kids find engaging, and B, it's not how kids learn. I'll give you a specific example. I was most recently the CEO of a science center in North Carolina before coming here. When I first started work at that science center seven years ago, they had an exhibit out front for, for the right flyer, right? Because of course, in North Carolina, they figure they're first in flight. And the exhibit was, you pressed a button, a fan turned on, and a model of the right flyer with the fan going fast enough would leave the ground. There is not a single kid, there's not a single parent, especially the dads, who are willing to stay long enough to watch that happen. They press the button, the fan starts, and they get bored, and they wander away long before this right flyer takes off. And even then, even if they stay, they have no idea why the plane is flying. Right? It hasn't taught them any scientific principle. And worse than that, we actually had a write-up next to it, which was wrong. Right? So when I arrived, there was this written explanation saying, planes fly because of Bernoulli's theorem, which is not true. So, so I said, we have to change this exhibit, and so it'll be more like the exhibits we're getting. Remove the model of the plane. Keep the fan 
and drill a hole in the plexiglass so people can put their hand in, which is exactly the same as you do, no doubt, when you're when the weather's not like today and you have your windows down in the car and you put your arm out the window. If you turn your hand this way while you're driving forward, your hand will go up because you're driving forward and your hand is in that orientation. If you turn it this way, it'll go down. And that's how planes fly. And kids realize that when they experience it. And that's the kind of thing we have to do in this museum is get kids to experiment, to put their arm in and try it and engineer a solution so they can see how it works. So we have our three preliminary designs. As I say, the public has chosen one, we've chosen one. We're not going to go and present that to the public until we know we have the funding to move forward. But each of these preliminary designs is much more expensive than what we can actually afford. So each of them is sort of um, design cues for what the final building will look like. Uh, this is my background. And this explains the public input that we went through. So the, the Community Foundation took it on as its role to consult with the public throughout to make sure that the museum master plan that we created provides the right museum for El Paso at this time to make education as good as possible for the citizens of El Paso. Now, how are we going to set this up? The Community Foundation recognized right away that the city was not going to be able to afford to build the museum that we know is the right museum for El Paso. And so the Community Foundation realized the only way to move forward was going to be in some kind of public-private partnership where the public was also contributing to this new museum. So even though the museum is primarily an educational institution, we know that it's going to require public support and that it has to be available to every citizen of the city. So in the original bond, there was 19.5 million set aside. That 19.5 million would not build the building for any children's museum. It wouldn't even be enough to build the building for the Thinkery in Austin or anywhere else, let alone produce the exhibits that you require for a museum like this to make it educationally valid. So when we went through the master planning process and we consulted with architects, et cetera, we recognized the overall cost was going to be something closer to $60 million, which includes the purchase of the property includes the remediation of the property, et cetera, that the city has already undertaken. So that's all part of this 60 million. So what the Community Foundation said was, we will try to match the city one to one. So for every dollar the city commits beyond the original bond request, the Community Foundation would also contribute a dollar. And we've put that in writing and guaranteed it. So the way that the we have negotiated a contract with the city, so that contract is coming up for a vote, and the way the contract would work is that the city would put aside the city's contribution into what's called a local government corporation. And that local government corporation would contract with us to actually build the facility. So the actual building process wouldn't fall under the city, it would fall under us. And any cost overruns would fall to us, not to the city. So when the city makes its contribution of $39.5 million, they, they are not uh, at risk of the builder coming back and saying, hey, it's going to cost us another 30 million to build this. We are at that risk and, of course, cannot afford to do that. But we have committed in writing to that 20 million in time to be able to build this building. When the building is complete with all of its exhibits, it reverts back to the city, but we will run the museum for the city. So it will not be a city run museum, it will be run by, uh, by the El Paso Children's Museum, which is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation, and the city will contract with us to run it. And so it is also different from the other museums in the city. The city has agreed to provide us with only one third of our budget instead of the total budget. We are responsible for uh, generating the rest of the revenue of two thirds of our budget each year in operating expenses. And that's a pattern that I've worked with also in North Carolina, so it's one that I'm familiar with. So we are going to change the lives of children growing up here in El Paso. And there's a very important reason to do that. And that's this, a couple of years ago, the New York Times did a study of every county in the country looking at income mobility and particularly looking at if you grew up poor in a, in a particular county, what was the opportunity to be able to get ahead? 
And it really is, in the end, a discussion about the educational supports that exist within the community and people's ability to take, take advantage of those educational supports. And El Paso, I should tell you, does not do that well. That is, if you grow up poor in El Paso, you're likely to end up behind people growing up poor in other counties in America. If you grow up wealthy in El Paso, you do okay. But, you know, your opportunities are different when you grow up wealthy anyway. But if we, what we need to change is we need to make sure that if you grow up poor in El Paso, that you have the opportunity to be able to move forward. And we do that pr by providing these kinds of educational supports things like the Children's Museum, things like the zoo, et cetera, that provide educational opportunities for children outside of the formal classroom, but still required to creating a well-rounded education. You know, we, we expect kids to have skills for the 21st century, uh, skills like creativity and collaboration, which we talked about, taking risks, trying things, because we know entrepreneurs, for example, very rarely succeed the first time they try something. And yet our whole school system is set around expect expectations of kids succeeding the first time they try everything. So that's why they, how they think it's going to work. And so we need to prevent, present pardon me, opportunities for them to be able to fail at some engineering thing they've tried and then to persevere, to try again, to realize that failing is actually perfectly normal and to then try again and work on a new solution. And that if we can provide children with those opportunities, then we're going to make future opportunities, future, uh, in, pardon me, income growth, et cetera, much more available to our community. So we've talked about the difference between formal and informal education, and uh, that's what I'm presenting here, and this is why this museum is necessary for the city of El Paso. So these are the skills we hope children develop and that they'll be able to use in the future as they move forward, and that we hope they build that future here in El Paso. Do you have any questions for me? Sure. From someone who works at the school district, uh, that our formal education is no longer like this. It's actually more like what you're talking about. And, and which is terrific. Right. And actually, I, I would never argue that we need to uh, stop uh, having a formal education system or right. something like that. I just think this is a wonderful support and supplement. Right. And I think we recognize the need to move towards a more active learning uh, model uh, because the raising of the hand and, and not collaborating is not, not working in our favor. So, so. When, yeah, so my own background, I taught uh, University Teachers College Faculty of Education for years, both in Canada and in Tanzania and East Africa. And the hardest thing is to get science teachers in particular to, uh, to move away from the standing at the podium and lecturing, which I'm doing right now, I realize, but uh, to get them away from that model and, and, and to actually get kids to experiment, et cetera. This is more of a question. I know last time we talked about the possible acquisition across. Those renderings all included that acquisition. Did it any success? So, I apologize not to Oh, no, no, that's okay. No, I think we make it pretty. We're okay to tag team, okay? So I'll take this question. Yet there was interest that was expressed and the owners were approached and they were not interested in, um, in selling the property. And, um, and so the determination at this point in, the, in, in this project is that we will not be pursuing that property. Um, the architects, when the competition, um, when all the, the, the parameters of the competition were released, were aware of the fact that the footprint could change a bit and so again, these are concepts, and as Paul said, they are they are in, they are reference points that you will see when the final design comes. But the final design won't look exactly like that anyway. And again, we were very transparent with the architectural groups that were competing to let them know that the footprint could change a bit. Um, it wasn't 100% at that point, but as of today, we are on the original footprint, and it will not expand into more property at this time. And our timeline on. Breaking ground? 2021 fall, assuming that, that we are able to move forward in the next. That's month opening. Or so. That's op opening. That's opening. Opening would be would be late 2021 if we can move forward and if we can if the if the finances are finalized and secured. How, how and just out of curiosity, have, have we already attempted the the private fund sector of it? I mean, is it are you getting good response? Uh, we're actually uh, probably over the eight million. Have the 20 million, that's, that's so awesome. we're getting a great response. That's awesome. And uh, you know, I mean, I feel like I'm incredibly lucky to have uh, managed to secure this position because working with the community foundation to raise the money is 
is the right way to go. It's much more difficult to do that independently as a museum. Working to, with a community partner like that is just fantastic. Excellent. I, again, it depends on when funding, but I, I would assume in January or February of 2019. No, that's just capital. The what issue with so many of these projects is that there wasn't, um, not only were they underfunded um, to get the projects rolling, but there was no plan, for example, that wouldn't have included, I mean, it, 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 couldn't, build, it couldn't have built the building, but things like exhibi you know, exhibitions weren't planned for in that funding, so. What, what portion of the nearly $60 million is the building itself? Um, so currently we're looking uh, at, um, so we're, we're trying to budget within, uh, say, 56 million because the city has spent some money to acquire the land, et cetera, mm -hmm. and I, I really, you know, I'm not going to risk uh, overspending. Uh, so including contingencies, et cetera, the building is probably going to be about uh, 25 of the 56. Uh, no, no, pardon me, 28 of the 56. And another 28 for the exhibits inside, which is actually a very strange thing. So we're working with um, an exhibit consultant, and, uh, and they're saying normally the building is multiples uh, expense-wise of what you do for exhibits. But from my point of view, it's a children's museum. What matters is what's happening inside. The children. So we're yeah, that's, dedicated That's where to, I was going with this, because I've had yeah. a number of people ask me why we're spending so much time on the ornate architecture yeah. yeah, so I mean, so, it's beautiful, but yeah, so our priority is, is to, to our priority is the exhibits, or at least my priority is the exhibits yeah. inside. Okay. And so we're looking at, which no other museum does, looking at splitting the cost roughly 50 50. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Like the accent. Take off, eh? <laughs> <laughs> So we can't do that until we until the funding is secured so that a contract can be executed. And so we're trying to make sure that we're doing everything in the proper order. And we look forward to announcing that. But we have to have the ducks in a row. So we have to have the financing so that we can conclude the contract and ensure that they can do what they what, what we need to have them do. And then the announcement will happen. Yes, I mean it's a, it's a it's a quiet. The can't you might want to talk a little bit more about yeah, the state. So, so that's capital campaigns are always like that. It starts with the larger donors, uh, but we're not going to go public with those until we go public with the campaigns. So right now we're in what's called the quiet phase. Yes, that that will come well before opening, but it probably will still be eighteen months away before we do that because you want to have all of your naming opportunities secured, etc., well beforehand. Any other updates? For children's? No, we're done with No, children's. no, not for children's. Um, I would like to speak to you about the MAC, but we have that in closed session, so it's up to you to make a determination about whether you want to take other option, the other other op options first and go into closed session, or if you want to go into closed session now so we can go forward with that update. That's up to you. Why don't we finish up and then we'll go into closed session that way if anybody Okay, that's good with me. Has okay. anything with regards All right, so to you're going to hear more from me. Sure. Okay. So let's go on to item number 6, discussion action on the BOAC request for information. Do you uh, gentlemen have anything that you would like to throw out there pertaining to item number 6? Okay. And number 7 on future Sorry, agendas? For, yes. Just so that I can make sure my carryover is you wanted the percentage for NIP, correct? Okay. That's, yeah. that's the only thing I've And just a, a little reminder, if there's something coming up that involves a groundbreaking ceremony or something that has a quality of life, a couple of days more morning would be good. Will do. We got like 48 hours the other day and we can't make this one. Okay. okay thank you. And then number seven, mm -hmm. anything there that you gentlemen are interested in? Okay. Okay, with that, we're going to... Uh, yes. There's, there's, no, there's no update on 5C. It'll only be 5B. No, just 5B. Mm -hmm. Just 5B. 
Uh, it's it's in legal right now. Yeah, there's nothing that we can discuss. We can't discuss that. No. Can we? Item seven. Did they did they ever make a draw for? Did they ever make a draw for the the multi the multi purpose center? You can say result? MPC. The M MPC. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Did they, what was did the question? Did they ever make an actual draw? Because we had, I mean, we, we were at the point of land acquisition. I'm assuming they drew money out of the, the bond money. Did they ever, I mean, is that, I guess that's mm -hmm. a finance question? Yeah. If, next? Sure, if I can just recommend in terms of how much. Uh, on the bond money, what was, what's been the expenditure specifically for this project? Maybe I recommend if we have, again, the, fi finance. the finance people that could come and report. Can we just get a, uh, uh, an update on, uh, sure. what did you call it, the MPC? MPC, MPC. Yes. Multi-Purpose Center. I feel like we're the ones that got in trouble by calling in their right on the first <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, next meeting if we can get an update on, because I know they purchase some property. Yeah, use of finance of what they finance so far on sure. that. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we're going to go to executive session, which means we have to ask everyone to leave. Oh. A motion. Yep. A motion to, to adjourn to, uh, yeah. Second. Second. Okay. Okay, and so just for purposes, the bond and overview advisory committee of the city of El Paso may retire to closed session pursuant to the Texas Government Code 551. So chapter due to discuss, discuss any of the following items on the agenda consistent with the terms of the Open Meetings Act. We will return to open session to take any final action and may also at any time during the meeting bring any forward any of the following items. So for purposes of this, we're just going to discuss the Mexican American Cultural Center project under section 551071, 551072, and 551087. Give me just one second.